everyone. Happy Friday. And this is Phil Hodgen. This is the Hodgen Law PC International Tax Lunch. We do this every month on the last Friday of the month at noon Pacific time. And you can listen in online over the phone or watch the show later on YouTube. Online is what you're doing now. So happy days. Um, this month's topic is Guide to Global Intangible Low-Taxed Income. So uh, this is our friend Section 951 Cap A. It came down from the skies in, at the end of 2017 to bless us and upset the apple cart in the way that international tax law worked for foreign corporations. So this is a super, super, super basic introduction. So the idea is give you an understanding of how it works, but no nerdy details at all. So if you're an advanced practitioner, this may be below your threshold for, and you may want to go wander off and have a cup of coffee and sit in the sun or something like that. But anyway, here we go. First editorial comment. You know, you see Stephen King and his advice to writers, the road to hell is paved with adjectives. And we've got three adjectives and a noun here. I am not going to be pronouncing the acronym for this thing because I think, number one, it was a sophomore giggle fest at the Treasury Department when they wrote this thing up. Uh, number two, I think it's a subliminal message to your brain that you should not be uttering in your head. So with a, you have a choice about how you're going to program your mind and how you're going to think. And I suggest that you don't add negative sounding words to an identification of self when you're doing thinking or speaking. So I will refer to it as section 951 cap a income or global intangible low tax income. End of editorial comments. Here's the table of contents for the day. We're going to start off with the introduction one and two with some really high level stuff. You know, do you even care about this or, or it doesn't apply to you? And then the second thing is two ideas that I find really useful in orienting my thinking as I'm going through this whole process and understanding how it works. Those are one and two. Then three through eight, we're going to march through the whole sequence of calculating what is this income inclusion amount all the way from the CFC's gross income all the way down to the global intangible low taxed income, which because of section 951 cap A open parentheses, little a close parentheses, is included in the shareholders gross income for US income tax purposes. We're going to do a little hand wave to a deduction that is allowed by section 250. Not going to do any calculations or anything like that. Just let you know that it exists and it may be important for the taxpayer for whom you're preparing a tax return. And then we'll wrap it up and that will be good enough for an hour. So the first question is, do you care? I mean, if you can possibly avoid the application of section 951 cap A, you want to. So let's look at the operative provision. So this is section 951 cap A, open parentheses, little a. So subsection A says, each person who is a US shareholder of any controlled foreign corporation for any taxable year shall include in gross income, blah, blah, blah. So this is the inclusion rule that says, if you have income in a corporation, then notwithstanding the existence of subchapter C and the fact that a corporation is an independent and separate taxpayer from its shareholders, don't care, we're going to include income anyway in the shareholder's personal income tax return. So this is analogous to subpart F income, which is section 951, but it applies to a different category of income, namely this global intangible low taxed income. So that's the important criterion. If you are not a US shareholder, or if the corporation, foreign corporation is not a controlled foreign corporation, 
then section 951 cap A does not apply. You do not have to worry about gross income being included in the shareholder's income tax return for that particular year. The definition of a controlled foreign corporation, the hand wavy definition here at section 957, subsection A, you know, is more than 50% of the corporation's shares by voter value is owned by people who are United States shareholders. So if you look at all the total shareholders of a foreign corporation and you say mustering all of the human beings who are or foreign or domestic corporations that are U.S. taxpayers, if it's under 50 percent of the ownership of the stock, no worries, this is not a controlled foreign corporation. If it's above, then you have a little bit further calculation to do. And that has to do with the U.S. shareholder. We only care about people who have 10% or more of the voter value of the stock of the foreign corporation. So in other words, a U.S. person, me, if I own 5% of the stock of a foreign corporation, I am not a United States person, so my 5% doesn't count to figuring out whether 50 more than 50% of the total value or vote of the stock is owned by U.S. shareholders. The summary, and I just want to reemphasize this, that you will want to find that both questions are true. Is the foreign corporation a CFC? Yes. Is the taxpayer that you're working with a United States shareholder? Yes. If both of those are yes, then section 951 cap A is going to force some gross income to be passed through to that shareholder's tax return, either at 1120 for a corporate return or 1040 for an individual. You can see the lower ranks, I'm not going to go through each of the different possibilities here, but you can see that, let's say you had a foreign corporation, let's just look at the second row for an example. You've got a foreign corporation that's 100% owned by U.S. citizens, individuals. Person number one owns 95% of the stock. Person number two owns 5% of the stock. First question, is the foreign corporation a controlled foreign corporation? Well, yes, it is, because more than 50% of the stock of the foreign corporation by voter value is owned by a U.S. shareholder. Mr. 95% owns more than 10%, so he's a U.S. shareholder, and therefore the foreign corporation exists. Um, but let's look at the second column. If you've got someone who's Mr. 5%, is that person a U.S. shareholder? Answer is no, because the person doesn't have 10% or more of the stock of the corporation. Therefore, Mr. 95% is going to have pass-through income, but Mr. 5% is not going to have pass-through income under Section 951 Cap A. So it's going to get weird. And... You know, you're going to look at this and you say, eh, the, the, the major point for you to take away from this is not every U.S. taxpayer is going to be treated the same once you've decided that you've got a controlled foreign corporation here. So with that aside, let's now assume that we've got a U.S. shareholder and we've got a controlled foreign corporation. So now we are worried about inclusion of the corporation's global intangible low taxed income because of section 951 cap A subsection A. So we're gonna to have to figure out what is this type of income? How much is it? And how does it drop onto the taxpayer's return? And here are my sort of operating foundational principles that I need to remind myself of again and again. The first one is that 
Subchapter C applies to domestic corporations as well as foreign corporations. So when you put on your thinking cap, just apply subchapter C concepts by default. And you know that subchapter C says a corporation, a C corporation is a separate taxpayer and a shareholder doesn't have any income unless there's an actual distribution to the shareholder from the C corporation. In that case, you're going to either have a dividend or a return of capital tax-free or capital gain. But that's section 301. However, section 951 cap A, the global intangible low tax income section that we now have, as well as the subpart F section, which is section 951, make an exception to the core principles of subchapter C. And they say, eh, for all other purposes of subchapter C, continue to apply those, corporate reorg, stuff like that. But once you've decided you've got some income, we're going to pass it through to the shareholder, whether or not there's an actual distribution. So I, the, for whatever reason I've been doing it, however long it is, and I still have to remind myself, a foreign corporation is just like a domestic corporation, but with the extra sparkles on top from all of this subpart F stuff. And the second idea that we have when we're thinking through this, just think of section 951 cap A as a subtraction game. You're going to start with all of the gross income of the foreign corporation, and we're going to steadily subtract things that are required, you know, required by the code. And we'll go through each of those one at a time. And the big mathematical subtraction fun happens in those boxes that are just outlined in their white inside with the black letters. And the remainder is left over are different subtotals eventually ending up with the total that's going to drop onto the shareholder's tax return. So it's a subtraction game. And conceptually, I like it a lot better than subpart F income because, you know, you, you, subpart F income, you just think intuitively, oh, that's passive income. But then there are all those special rules that apply because taxpayers got creative to work around the subpart F definition. In the bad old days, pre 2017, a controlled foreign corporation would be taxed like this. If, it, if income was subpart F income, then it got pushed straight through to the US shareholder and got taxed currently. If it was not subpart F income, then the controlled foreign corporation behaved just like a regular C corporation and the shareholder did not recognize any income until there was a distribution from the controlled foreign corporation to the US shareholder. So pre 2017, that's why the Apples and the Googles of the world were able to amass hundreds of billions of dollars in income in their foreign subsidiaries without paying current US tax on that income. And section 951 cap A was the government's counter countermeasure to that so that it was no longer possible to arbitrarily decide that you want to defer income on, I mean, de defer taxation on income earned in foreign operations through controlled foreign corporations. So this plugged the hole. And when you look at the methodology they used for setting up what is subpart F income, it was subpart F income is one of these, one of those, you know, passive income, interest, dividends, capital gains, this, that, and the other. And then over time, you had 30 years or 40 years of accretion of extra things to plug loopholes that taxpayers found, and it's a mess. Whereas this method is quite simple. You start with everything and subtract what is not global intangible low tax income, and you're end, you end up with what it is. And so you put on your medieval theologian hat and use the methodology of via negativa to define you know, what is the meaning of God? What are God's attributes? Well, God is not this, God is not that. So whatever is left over afterwards, that must mean what God is. That's the kind of methodology that section 951 cap A is using. Definitions by subtraction. 
Now we're going to start with the subtraction. We're going to start at the very top with the gross income of the controlled foreign corporation. I'm going to walk you through a very simple model and sort of describe what's going on here and show you the numbers and how numbers move from the form 5471 schedule I-1, which is where all the fun and games happens, and moves on to form 8992, which is where the actual calculation of the inclusion amount happens. The, we're at the top row right now, highlighted in red. We're determining what is the controlled foreign corporation's gross income. Here's my little sample P&L. So if I could get a simpler, I would, but it's pretty simple. 20,000 of sales, uh, $3,000 of expenses, depreciation and interest, uh, 17,000 net profit. This is what you're going to see on the sample return pages as we go through. You start at the top. So form schedule I-1 is your friend. This is where it's going to happen. The gross income shows up on line one at the top. And how do you get the gross income? Well, for section 951 cap A, it says, just go over to the subpart F rules and use the same methodology for calculating the CFC's gross income that you use over there. So I give you the citation to the regs under section 951 cap A that say, go to the subpart F rules. And I give you the subpart F regulations that give you the how to compute gross income, yeah, the rules of the road, the map. So the, it's that simple. Second, we're going to now look at exclusions from the CFC's gross income. We're in the little red box, and this is where the fun and game starts. So remember, let's, we're starting from the beginning of everything that came in that's gross income for the controlled foreign corporation. And now we're going to do a bunch of exclusions. And think of the exclusions like this. The government is trying to define all of the controlled foreign corporation's income and tax it in some way but they don't want to have overlap. So if you have $100 of gross income for the controlled foreign corporation, it might be that if you look at the subpart F definitions, it might look like subpart F income. And you don't want to have that $100 of income taxed under the subpart F rules, as well as the section 951 cap A uh, global intangible low tax income rules. So this is a method for eliminating double taxation or is simplifying it. So a dollar of income only gets taxed once. Oops, there we go. Schedule I-1. So we're looking at lines two and three here. So you see the exclusions and A through E are the five of them. And that's thankfully that's all there is. And line three is just the total. That, and so we're in my simple example, I am assuming that none of these will apply. But let's look at them just one at a time. Why does, and I'm not going to look at all of them just in the interest of time, but let's just look at a couple. 2A, effectively connected income. So if, if the corporation had $20,000 of gross income, and 5,000 came from effectively connected income and 15,000 was everything else, we would not want to have section 951 cap A apply to that 5,000. And why? Because effectively connected income of a foreign corporation is reportable and taxable on form 1120F. And so it's getting taxed and it's getting included in the tax base of the United States. So there's no reason to flow that income back upstream to the U.S. shareholder and get it taxed again. Second one, 2B, you know, again, a simple example, subpart F income. Let's say that we have $20,000 of gross income and just make pretend that there's $2,000 of subpart F income. 
so 18,000 of everything else and 2,000 of subpart F income, we would not want the subpart F income to be passed through to gross income because of, of section 951 and then get passed through again because of section 951 cap A to gross income. And therefore we subtract it from the total gross income in order to arrive at the gross income that we want to play with for section 951 cap A in the global intangible low taxed income system. So that's why the, the rules exist. So basically look at these things and say for A through E, the government already has a plan for how to deal with these. And so don't worry about them. We're going to subtract them from what we're doing here for purposes of global intangible low tax income. One that's worth looking at is 2C, which is the high tax exception income. And this one is baked into the whole definition of this new kind of bad income that's included in your gross income every year because of the 2017 tax law change that added section 951 cap A. Yeah, we, we are called global intangible low taxed income. So now we have income that is high taxed. And if it's high tax, the government figures, well, you're not doing any kind of fun and games and stuff like that that we're, you're trying, not trying to dodge U.S. taxes because you're getting taxed at a high rate in a foreign country. So it's probably going to be okay. And the high tax exception means you look at the income of the corporation and ask whether it was taxed at 90% or more of the applicable U.S. tax rate. So 90% of 21%, I think it's 18.9%. So that's, that's what's there. If you're, you're, you've, Clearly, if you're getting taxed, you're not having this foreign subsidiary because of uh, tax planning. That's what we call it um, in the United States. So again, here are the things that I'm just giving you a reference to the Internal Revenue Code. And obviously, there are regulations behind that that explain things more. But those are the important ones. And in your world, my guess is you're going to see subpart F income most of the time. You might see high tax exception income. And um, I rarely see effectively connected income because usually there's a fairly deliberate plan that if the foreign corporation is going to be engaged in business in the United States, they're going to create a subsidiary. All right. Gross tested income. We did all those exclusions, line two and three, and what we are left with is gross income minus all the exclusions means the gross tested income. This phrase tested income matters for purpose of section 951 cap A. And so this is the first cut at what we got. Here's where it shows up. It's a simple subtraction game. Uh, Line one minus line three equals line four. In our super simple example, there were no inclusions and therefore gross income equals gross tested income. And line four doesn't use the magic phrase gross tested income, but that's what it's called. Um, and that's what we'll call it for the rest of this presentation. Now we're going to move on to tested income. And the anal retentive me wishes that they had defined this as net tested income just for the nice symmetry between gross tested and net tested, but they just call it simple net tested. So they didn't ask me before they wrote these things. Again, we're in the little math phase of the game where we're going to look at the expenses and the taxes allocated to this category of income. And we're going to subtract it from gross tested income, and we will end up with net tested income, or just as the code calls it, tested income. Here are, here's, it shows up on line five of schedule I1. And in my little simple PL, we had depreciation of $2,000 and interest expense of $1,000, total $3,000 of expenses we're saying that all of these are allocated to this category of income. 
because we're her heroically assuming that this corporation did nothing else. But, and, the, and the reason you know that this corporation did nothing else and generated no other types of income is because you look at line two. So what does allowable and allocable mean? Well, it's the same rules that you use for subpart F income. And basically you pretend that the CFC is a domestic corporation and ask yourself whether the, a, a deduction is allowable for that specific expense item. And I give you the reference to the subpart F regs again, and the enabling regulation under section 951 cap A that tells you to go look at the subpart F regs. So that's the allowable. So that's pretty straightforward. The normal rules for domestic C corporations. Then the allocation. Remember, you're going to look at all of the deductions that are allowable at the gross level, and then you're going to allocate those to all the different categories of the CFC's types of income. Remember, there are five exclusions and then whatever the remainder is, which is gross tested income. So you're going to do allocation. And again, you're going to use the subpart F rules. And at a high level, what you're going to see is if you can tag a specific expense to a sp that was used to generate a specific type of income, then you allocate that specific expense to that specific category of income. If you can't, then you're going to have a prorating game and you're going to allocate a portion of it. So that's the, that's the concept. And again, nothing here is new at all. This is what we, we've been working with for a long time. All right, so now we come up with tested income. So we've done the allocation and the allowable and allocation of the expenses. And under my assumptions, we've said, well, the $2,000 of depreciation is definitely deductible and the $1,000 of interest income is definitely, interest expense, pardon me, is definitely deductible. And there are no other categories of income that we had, C line two of that schedule I1. And therefore, 100% of these expenses are allocable to the, the gross tested income, and we're going to do a subtraction. And here's how the subtraction works. It says line four minus line five. And important thing to look at on line five, and one of the meta reasons why you never believe anything you see on a tax form, it says deductions properly allocable to amount on line four. So this is the allocation um, game that I talked about on a previous slide. If you look at the instructions and better yet, you look at the code, it says you're going to allocate deductions and income taxes of the CFC that are allocable to that income category. So in, a, in my example, I'm assuming no corporate income tax was paid by the CFC to a foreign corporation. So the tax item is zero. And that's why the deductions are the only things there. But it's important not to just read what the line says and take it as gospel because frequently it's not. And here's an example. But in any event, line six, we've got tested income. And that, again, simple math. 20 minus three equals 17,000. This is the first of the numbers that we are going to port over from schedule I-1 to for, uh, form 8992, which is the calculation engine for global intangible low tax income. And form 8992 has two parts, one of which you're looking at right now. Well. This is the it, page one has part one and part two, but there's a schedule A attached to it. So you can see in the line instructions, it makes a reference to form 8992 schedule A. Schedule A is the aggregation and totaling machine that takes all of the relevant numbers off of all of the schedule I1s of all of the CFCs in which the, C the US taxpayer is a shareholder, aggregates them all together, gives you totals, and you pull the totals forward to the 
front page of Form 8992. I haven't shown you Schedule A here simply because we're pretending that this particular shareholder only has stock in one CFC, so why bother? And section, the second reason is time and brain power. So, but just know that bef numbers are technically going to go from Form 5471 Schedule I-1 over to this Form 8992 Schedule A in the relevant column, then you're going to total at the bottom, and then you're going to pull the total at the bottom of a column over to wherever it tells you to here on the front page of Form 8992. And now we come to the fun part. So everything up to now has been fairly straightforward. The accounting is familiar. The tax concepts are familiar. The methodology is familiar because for the most part, we're importing it from the subpart F rules that have existed since the 60s. So all of that's been straightforward to come down to the amount of tested income. Now we're going to move into, this is the Sudoku game that the Congress gave you to distract you from what's really happening in your life. Calculating net deemed tangible investment return. Anytime you see deemed, you say, make pretend, because that's the code word in the Internal Revenue Code for let's make pretend. It's not realistic pretended. So where we are now is we've got tested income, which we've calculated, and now we're going to calculate this net deemed tangible investment return number, which is a totally arbitrary and made up number that was bestowed on us by Congress, which means that it doesn't seem to have any connection with economic reality, which in turn to mean me means that it was stuck in here for political reasons to get the bill passed. So let's calculate it through, and it's a bit of a pill to go through. So let's go slow. So net, I'm going to call it DTIR, or deemed tangible investment return, depending on how energetic I feel. But here's a summary, and we'll go into nerdy detail in a second, of how you get there. We're gonna start with this thing where the acronym is QBAI, and everybody seems to refer to this as QBI because tax pros love acronyms. What it means is Qualified Business Asset Investment. And this, we'll talk more about what this means, but it's basically assets that the corporation owns that generates the kind of income that we're interested in right here. Um, eh, look at that. A typo, where I reference on that first line, Internal Revenue Code Section 951D, it should be 951 Cap A D. There's always a typo, even after you multiple times you proofread it. Um, you, so you get that number, and we'll talk about how to get it. You multiply it by an arbitrary 10%, and you get the deemed tangible income return. And then you subtract a number called the specified interest expense, and you end up with a net deemed tangible income return. So what's happening here? What's happening here is the government is looking at the CFC and it is looking at the operations and assets of the company and you're saying, okay, some of this profit is that the CFC generated in the tax year is because it owned a bunch of depreciable assets. And for any of those depreciable assets, we're going to arbitrarily treat 10% of the profit allocable to what we pretend it was generated by these depreciable assets. 10% of that profit is going to be tax-free to you. It just doesn't get taxed, period, end of story. So that's what's happening. And then the specified interest expense line is a limit on this where they don't want you to lard up the company with too much interest expense. And therefore, this is a limitation on how much of this deemed tangible in 
income return is going to be tax-free to you permanently. Onward to the big picture. There's a lot of little steps here and particularly in the interest part. So you see here on the far right, this mimics what's happening on form 8992 uh, and schedule I-1. But the three columns on the left are all of the little things that you have to figure out in order to get to this number that's called specified interest expense, which is the number that matters, which is the limiting amount for the deemed tangible income return. We start with interest expense. We're going to, and you calculate a thing called qualified interest expense. This is not going to matter to you unless the CFC is a dealer in securities or has um, active financing income. And the idea here is to plug a hole that was left over from the days when a CFC could get deferral of its active business profits. So if you're in the active business of providing financing, then your income isn't subpart F income, therefore it gets trapped behind and doesn't get taxed automatically. And so this is, this is an idea to plug a gap here. And I'm not gonna go into details about all of that because it's an edge case, frankly. We, so in our example, you're going to see that this number is zero because our corporation is not that. Our corporation, let's say, is a dry cleaner. The deduction, then we're going to start with interest expense again, and we're going to drop down, subtract qualified interest expense, and this thing called tested loss Q by amount, which is when you have a CFC that's running at a loss. So again, I'm gonna finesse that as out of bounds for just a basic high level introduction overview of global intangible low tax income. And you end up with tested interest income. Tested interest income, is, pardon me, you end up with tested interest expense. You offset it against tested interest income because you want to come to a net number and you come out with specified interest expense. And the hard part of this, frankly, for me, is remembering that adjective at the front end and remember the road to hell is paved with adjectives, qualified, tested, and specified. But specified is what you're looking for. And then once you have that, the final calculation of net deemed tangible income return is easy. First, the asset base, this Q by thing. Your job as the return preparer is to look at the CFC's assets and identify all the specified tangible property. So this is stuff that you can depreciate and is used to produce tested income. So the category of income that we're talking about. The second thing is you're going to calculate the adjusted basis for each asset on a quarterly basis and then compute, then that's going to be the number that you're going to use to make Q by. So you, you calculate the adjusted basis and take the average and that's your number that you're going to use. And the reason for this and a whole bunch of other stuff, if you look in the regulations is they don't want you to do funny games, right? buy a million dollar asset on December 30 and sell it on January 2 in the next tax year. Fun stuff like that. So that's your, that's your number. So it's, a, it's an adjusted basis number with some special calculation rules attached to it. And that's your QBAI, Qualified Business Asset Investment. And it's on line eight of Schedule I-1. So here you have it. And for our purposes of simple math, I've given you just an arbitrary calculation pulled out of the sky that this corporation's qualified business asset investment is $18,000. Now, the deemed tangible investment income return is simply 10% of that. The total of all of the QBAI numbers for all of your corporations comes off of Schedule A, 
at the bottom of column G. In our situation, I'm not preparing and showing you schedule A just because I'm lazy. And so we're just going to do a simple math in our head of $18,000 times 10% equals $1,800. So that's the deemed tangible income return that we have to look at before we put on the limitation on the amount that you're allowed to have tax-free. Sideline, why is it tax-free? Well, okay, so you're going to have... You have 17,000 of CFC tested income. That's going to create 17,000 of earnings and profits in the controlled foreign corporation, right? And we're going to, as you see at the bottom, line five, jumping ahead for a second, 16.2 of that is going to be included in the shareholder's uh, gross income. What do we do with the rest of the ENP that's still inside the corporation, but is not included in the shareholder's gross income? Well, if you have a domestic corporation, it's going to pay out a dividend. And what happens to the domestic corporation that's a shareholder of this controlled foreign corporation when it receives a, a distribution of money? Well, it's a dividend to the extent of ENP. So if 17,000 was distributed in this year, we would have $800 of untaxed ENP, and we would have 16,200 of taxed ENP. And section 959 gives us some fun, but we have $800 of taxable ENP, but the dividend received exclusion of section 245 cap A tells us it's not going to get taxed. So it's tax-free forever for a C corporation shareholder. For a U.S. person, the normal rules are going to apply, and that $800 is going to be taxed as a dividend to the extent of the distribution. So as usual, corporations get better results than humans, and that's the way it works. So you can make a section 962 election if you don't like that result, but 962 might not be the best result for you. Anyway, we've got the deemed tangible income return. We're now going to subtract the specified interest expense in order to get the net deemed tangible income return. So this is the amount that's really truly non-taxable. So we started with, as you remember from looking at the previous page, we started with, oh boy, 1800 bucks of this profit is going to be tax-free. And we ended up with 800. What happened? So we, we did got a lot less than 10% of this profit tax-free. Again, this is the same thing as before, how we're just moving from qualified to tested to specified interest expense. So I won't go through that one more time. But let's look at it on schedule I-1 so you can kind of see what's happening at line nine. We've taken the interest expense that's allocable to this global intangible low tax income and is included in line five as total, part of the total deductions and is broken out here at line 9A. Then 9B, we have this qualified interest expense line item, which as I said, only applies to dealers and securities and people with active financing income. Um, line C, which matters only if we have a CFC with a tested loss, so it's running at a loss in the current calendar year, do a simple sum and then subtraction. I mean, a simple sum of those three numbers and line 9D shows the tested interest expense. So out of the total interest that we used as a normal deduction in calculating ten tested income, how much of this is open quotes, tested interest expense, close quotes? The answer is the full thousand dollars. Again, this is gonna go over to schedule A and then from schedule A come over to part two of form 8992, the first page. So you can see that the full $1,000 came over to line 3A, tested income. The, I mean, tested expense, pardon me. And line 3B is zero. We don't have any offsetting interest income. 
under my scenario. And so line C, we have tested down to specified. So we went from qualified, which we assumed was zero on schedule I1, to tested, which was a thousand, to specif on form 8992, to specified, which is also 1000 on form 8992. So that's how we got to specified interest expense. And finally, to the net deemed tangible investment <sighs> income. Okay. There are a few slides here where I use tangible income return correctly and tangible investment return incorrectly. Memo to self, fix slides. So line four, simple subtraction. So here's how you see that the impact of interest expense incurred by a CFC in generating global intangible low taxed income, that interest expense reduces the amount of the global intangible low tax income, well, the gross tested income correction that can be, um, let me start that sentence again. The net deemed tangible income return is going to reduce the amount of income that's included in the gross income. And it's going to penalize companies that have a lot of interest and it's going to maximize the amount of the profit that is tax-free for companies that have low amounts of interest in expense. And then finally, just a quick summary, the same slide one more time, just to show you how we got to where we are to that net deemed tangible income return. And now we come finally to the number that the client cares about, which is how much gross income shows up on the personal income tax return or on form 1120. And that's the number, line five at the bottom. So this number um, from memory goes to schedule C, I forget which line for form 1120 or it goes to schedule one, I believe line eight is the other income category uh, line for form 1040. So that's how it's going to go and it's going to simply get included in gross income and the tax liability will get calculated accordingly. Finally, let's talk about the section 250 deduction. And it exists for now, at the moment, it is 50% of whatever that inclusion number is. So line five of part two of form 8992, global intangible low taxed income, whatever that is, divide by two and you get an arbitrary deduction if the taxpayer is a domestic corporation. If it's an individual, no. If it's a Individual, if it's an individual taxpayer that's made the Section 962 election, yes. And I just give you the sample form blank for Form 8993. All the fun is going to happen in Part 3 down at the bottom. But that's the number. I forget what year it is, but in a few years, that 50% is going to drop to 37.5%. And I would expect over time either naturally built into the code or for political reasons, this deduction is going to get taken away arbitrarily and, and everything is going to be fully taxable. But it's good while it lasts. So it's going to arbitrarily reduce the gross income because if you have a $16,800, pardon me, under our example, $16,200 gross income inclusion and an offsetting deduction of $8,100, you only have $8,100 of taxable income, which is cuts your tax liability in half for no reason at all, except the beneficence of Congress. So just to confirm, here are the citations for who is allowed to take the Section 250 deduction. It's only domestic C corporations and individuals who make the Section 962 election. And 
concluding this and we'll wrap it up a little bit early this month. So yay for us. Um, Priest 2017, basic concept was it was possible to get deferral of US taxation for foreign source income if you used a corporation and the corporation's net profit was not categorized as subpart F income. That was section 951. Section 951 cap A essentially makes all of the CFC's income taxable because now it's going to take ev everything else that wasn't sucked up before because of 951 and make it mostly taxable. And the mostly I'm just talking about that net deemed tangible income return thing. And the bottom line for me is that there's an enormous amount of complexity and overhead and possibility for error and possibility for penalties here. And I think there is, there becomes a strong incentive to frankly not use CFCs as you can. So if you have a situation where you have a client who has a controlled foreign corporation, I would look very strongly at making a check the box election to make it a disregarded entity. That will solve a problem. Alternatively, you do a check the box election and it will convert it into a foreign partnership. And that might solve some problems here because it eliminates a, a lot of the complexity and overhead, if nothing else. Uh, a third idea is that you take that corporation and you do a domestication where you go to Delaware and you register that corporation in Delaware. And now suddenly the corporation is like an individual who has two, tax, uh, two, has two passports, a U.S. passport and a something else. And functionally, you've created a domestic corporation here. And now all of a sudden, all of these complexities of subpart F and, and section 951 cap A and the global intangible low tax income and all that fun stuff goes away. The corporation still exists in the foreign country. So if you need the corporation for active business purposes, banking, hiring employees, all that fun stuff in the foreign corporation, you've got it there, but you have a domestic corporation for compliance purposes and tax computation purposes. And that's a lot easier. Um, so, and there is a companion kind of uh, section 250 deduction called FDII, which is for U.S. corporations doing business abroad, where you can functionally get the same 50% deduction. So it's pretty good. That, so that's my encouragement to you. You do this a few times for somebody and you'll suddenly be looking for restructuring possibilities, if only to keep yourself from having too much brain damage. And there's my handy dandy disclaimer, you know, disclaimer, not disclaimer, please don't blame me for anything I said, because I'm probably wrong. And I thank you. Ping me by email if you have any questions, happy to chat, happy to help you brainstorm, um, trying to figure out ways to remove stress from your life by restructuring or at least answering some simple questions, I hope. Well, that's all of it for now. Thanks for joining this month. Please send me an email again if I didn't answer a question and or your question came up in your head. Next month, the session is going to be on August 27, 2021, presented by me again. And the topic will be the nine filing categories of Form 5471. So, you know, in the good old days, we only had five categories of filers. And category one was dormant for a long time. So it was actually four in practicality. But with the 27 tax law change, it metastasized. And now we have nine. So I'm going to be talking through each of those so you can figure out whether your particular taxpayer has to check any of one of those boxes. If you're not already on our email list, please go to sign up and get the announcement of this of the upcoming sessions. Uh, go to hodgen.com news slash newsletters to do this. And if you're already on the newsletter list, uh, thank you for being there and tell your friends to sign up and tell your friends to show up next month on August 27. 
that is it for me. Happy July and see you next month.